Ecology. I'm here to share with us, uh, not written in stone, a look at the changing faces of dinosaurs. Please help me welcome Scott Johnston. Alrighty, well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really excited to see all of you here today and see so many people who are interested in seeing how our understanding of dinosaurs has changed so much through the years. So, as previously said, I'm Scott Johnston. I've worked at the Museum of Paleontology for almost a decade now, actually a little over a decade. So, a little bit about the guy who's gonna be talking at you for the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, I fell in love with dinosaurs at a very early age, like a lot of people did. It, I was around two when my dad first took me to the Carnegie Museum in, in Pittsburgh. And ever since then, I was hooked. I began working at the University of Michigan Museum, uh, uh, UMM Museum of Paleontology's prep lab when I was 14, actually before I even started high school. And I'm a recent graduate from the U of M. Uh, I got my degree in uh, Earth and Environmental Sciences and with a focus in paleontology, and I've been on several digs in my time studying there, including the Chelsea Mammoth find, the Bristly Mammoth, if you guys have heard about that one relatively recently, and another one to the Hell Creek in 2014. That was an absolute blast. That's where we find a lot of the big, famous, charismatic American dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus, Triceratops, Ankylosaurus. And I'm actually going to be leaving for one in a little over a week, going to the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry near Price, Utah, where it'll probably be a nice, chilly 110 <laughs> degrees with no shade. And it's going to be an absolute blast. But it's one of the most productive uh, carnivorous dinosaur fossil sites in the world. They found over 60 Allosaurus there, and it's amazing. I've been really excited to go there. So, since this is a tea time, I thought we, and my friends know how much I love a good pun, I think it's about time I start just talking about me, and we get tea historic. <laughs> so, uh, these are from an artist, Piper Thibodeau, that I follow on Twitter. She's incredible. Some of my favorites are the T-Rex, the T-Livery Service, and the, and the T-Ceratops there. So, <laughs> and I'll be using my hiking pole to uh, indicate what I'm talking about. Thought I'd do something a little bit more analog and on theme than a laser pointer. So. When I say the word dinosaur, I imagine most of you think of things that look a lot like this. These gigantic, horrifying monsters of the silver screen that chase protagonists around and roar so loud they shake the theater. Or these depictions of these uh, tail-dragging, swamp-dwelling behemoths of a bygone era. Now, I hope over the course of this talk, you guys will come to realize that this could not be further from the truth. So, the first thing that we need to really straighten out is really, what is a dinosaur? Now that, seemed like, that might seem like a relatively simple question, but it's, I imagine a lot of you have, not to point fingers, but an incorrect idea of what a dinosaur actually is. So, to that regard, I made a pop quiz. I hope all of you studied. This will go on your final, uh, this will be on the final exam. So, what about this guy right here? This is Dimetrodon. Is this a dinosaur? You just shout it out. No need to raise hands right now. Yes, no, yes, no. No, this is not a dinosaur. How about Tyrannosaurus right here? Dinosaur? Yes, is. Yes, Tyrannosaurus is a dinosaur. Pteranodon, the pterodactyl. I'm hearing a lot of yeses. No. How about Plesiosaurus? Yes? No? No? I'm hearing some no's. Good. No. Sarcosuchus, big giant crocodile. Yes? No. Jeez. Did anybody do the reading? Gosh. Woolly mammoth? No. Good. All right. You guys at least did that. Dodos. Hearing some yeses, because yes, dodos are dinosaurs. So I imagine some of you guys might have some questions about this, like why is dodo a dinosaur? Why are none of those other ones dinosaurs? 
So, when I say dinosaur, dinosaur has a very specific definition. It's not just anything that's big and old and extinct. Now, what makes a dinosaur a dinosaur is actually comes back to when dinosaurs were first described. Now, the definition of a dinosaur is the common ancestor and all of the descendants between the first two dinosaurs ever discovered, Iguanodon and Megalosaurus. These two were found in England, and when I say described, I don't mean discovered. Uh, scientific description is when the animal is actually written down in a scientific journal, it's given characteristics, and essentially just it formally recognized by science and given a name. So, as you can see by the dates, wasn't that long ago that the first dinosaurs were really recognized as being dinosaurs. And it actually wasn't until years later that uh, the term dinosaur was coined by Sir Richard Owen. So, if we have each of the footprints of these dinosaurs represent themselves, and we draw a line of uh, ancestry between them and find where it intersects here, that point and everything from it are going to be dinosaurs. So there's a lot of animals in this group. A lot of them I bet you guys have heard of or at least recognize, and a lot of them that I bet you guys don't. There's some very weird ones out there. The dinosaurs were a very diverse and successful group. When we call something a dinosaur that's old, outdated, and obsolete, again, couldn't be further from the truth. These guys had it made for a very long time. But I promised you guys birds. Where are birds? Birds fall right here, right next to the raptor dinosaurs or the dromaeosaurs on the same branch that includes the tyrannosaurs and stuff. So that means that a chicken is closer related to a T-Rex than it is to anything else. And what about those weird flying dinosaurs, the pterosaurs. Again, not dinosaurs. They fall right there, just outside of the family of dinosauria. So that means they're not dinosaurs. They're closely related. They lived in the same time at the same places, but again, not dinosaurs. And our crocodiles fall right there. And that makes this entire group, we call it the archosauria, or the ruling reptiles. And Again, to blow your minds a little bit more, that means that crocodiles are closer related to birds than crocodiles are to lizards and snakes and turtles and stuff like that. Even though they don't really look the same, if you look at their skeletons and their history, they actually do come from a relatively recent common ancestor. Now, on the right side, the dinosaur family tree is broken up into two parts. We have the ornithischians, the bird-hipped dinosaurs. They have that orange bone that's called the pubis that's pointing backwards in ornithischian dinosaurs. And on sauroschian dinosaurs, or lizard hip dinosaurs, it's pointing forwards. Now, Scott, why are birds on the lizard hip dinosaur part of the tree? And frankly, the answer to that is very simple. That was before we knew that birds are dinosaurs. So it really doesn't matter if uh, the name of a group even really makes sense as long as it's distinct from everything else. There's actually an entire family of dinosaurs called the oviraptors, which means the egg thieves. And they didn't steal eggs at all, but that's what their, na that's what their name means. They need a better PR department or something. So all this family tree stuff is all well and good, but I don't imagine any of you guys will really hold on to cladograms in your head for years on end. So I'm going to give you guys a little cheat sheet of if you're walking through a museum or if you're watching a movie or something. If you see an animal that you're not sure of, figure out if it's a dinosaur or not. All right, so question one, are its legs directly underneath its body like we see here? Or are they splayed off to the side like we see here? If they're splayed off to the side, that is not a dinosaur. Dinosaurs have their legs directly underneath their body, kind of like we do, which follows on to the next question. If yes, you go to, does it have feathers and or scales? If it does, ha if it does not have feathers and or scales, then that is not a dinosaur, unfortunately. But if it does, you've found yourself a dinosaur, or you've at least found something that's really close to a dinosaur, because there are some fringe cases that get a little confusing. So 
If you find something that is really confusing, if you're at a really specialty museum or something, uh, if you look on the tibia of the animal, you'll see this little protrusion right there. That's called a nemeal crest, spelled with a silent C in front of that. And that is a feature that is exclusive to dinosaurs. So if you find that, congratulations, you've found a dinosaur. So dinosaurs, as I said, they were extremely successful and they lived over a very long time span. They lived during what was called the Mesozoic era. And that literally just translates to the Middle Era. So the Mesozoic is broken up into three parts, the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. And you can see the time periods, that are, uh, the, the time designations that separate each of those. And for the record, MA stands for millions of years ago. So that, that's, that's, the DV, that's our little slang on there so we don't have to write that out in every scientific paper all the time. So what differentiates these time periods are for most of them, well, for most of the ones we're talking about here, are mass extinctions. At the, at the end of the Permian and the beginning of the Triassic, we had the Permo-Triassic mass extinction, which is the most horrifying, devastating mass extinction that has ever happened. Over 95% of all life on Earth went extinct. It's the closest that life on Earth has ever come to completely being snuffed out. And we kind of have no idea why it happened, because it was so long ago. And then we have the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction, where the dinosaurs were actually really able to take over and become the dominant animals. Because during the Triassic period, there were bigger, scarier things than the dinosaurs that were essentially taking all the good jobs, to put it in the easiest way possible. Now, there actually isn't a mass extinction between the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. That's broken up by some geologic layers that we find all around the world that, we can, that scientists agree are the designation between those two. But at the end of the Cretaceous, we have the very famous KPG mass extinction. And yes, KPG, not CPG, because uh, the Carboniferous era was, came much before that and they took the C. So had to use the K and the PG for Cretaceous Paleogene. And that is where the big meteor hit the Yucatan Peninsula and volcanoes erupted like all over India and the non-avian dinosaurs died out. So the non-bird dinosaurs. Now, dinosaurs first appeared about right there, about 231 million years ago. And something a lot of you might not know, the first mammals evolved right there right after the time of the dinosaurs. That means that for most of the time, uh, for essentially all the time that dinosaurs were around, so were our ancestors, so were mammals. Now they were lurking in the shadows, coming out at night because, well, the dinosaurs had all those good jobs. So the <laughs> mammals had to stick to being insectivores, eating bugs and stuff, or coming out at night and eating smaller prey. And the first birds evolved right about there, 148 million years ago, with uh, Archaeopteryx and some of those earlier birds. And to give you guys an idea of how big of a time span I'm talking about here, uh, one of the most iconic dinosaurs, Stegosaurus, with the big plates on its back, spikes on its tail, I'm sure you guys know it, it evolved, uh, its last appearance in the fossil record is 150 million years ago, about right smack dab in the period of the time of the dinosaurs. And the first appearance of T. rex, Tyrannosaurus, is 68 million years ago. It was right at the end of the time of the dinosaurs. Now that means that the time period separating Stegosaurus and T. rex is 82 million years, which is larger than the time period separating T. rex from us, which is 66 million years, which is it's hard, it's hard to keep that in your mind, isn't it? It's pretty crazy to think about this enormity of time. So even though dinosaurs were around for such a ridiculously long period of time, we have a pretty good history of getting them really wrong when we're uh, <laughs> illustrating them and thinking about what they look like. One of my favorite ones, and th these are all real illustrations that were done in the 1800s and early 1900s of what people thought dinosaurs actually looked like. If you guys have seen the Jurassic Park movies, you know that literally no dinosaurs look anything like this. Uh, one of my favorites here, this one's Stegosaurus. 
uh, with those spikes popping out all over its body and those big iconic plates laying flat uh, like shingles on a roof along its back. That's actually where it got its name from. Its name means the roofed lizard because they thought it was shingled with those. And it wasn't until we found better skeletons that we found out that, wow, that is absolutely not how that thing looked. But instead of going through each individual dinosaur or dinosaurs in general and showing you guys what has changed, I thought it would be better to illustrate how one specific dinosaur has changed over the years. It's a fantastic story that is ripe for a movie adaptation. I mean, I need to get Hollywood on and have them work on this at some point. Like, I, I say that like I have people in Hollywood, geez. Uh, <laughs> But, I mean, it has everything for a major motion picture. It has drama, it has passion, it has betrayal, <laughs> loss, discovery, voyages to, uh, voyages to, uh, an uh, to ancient and mysterious areas, and, and not a small amount of luck. And of course, as every good story needs, it has Nazis. <laughs> and that is the story of Spinosaurus. One of the most bizarre dinosaurs that has ever lived. Now, if we're going to talk about Spinosaurus, we need to talk about the paleontologist who discovered it, which, uh, who goes by the incredible name of Ernst, Stromer Fri Ernst Freeherr Stromer von Reichenbach, or as we're going to call him, Ernst Stromer. Now, Ernst Stromer was born in Bavaria to nobility in 1871, and he is most famous for leading an, ex an expedition to Egypt in 1910. And his main motivation for going to Egypt at that time was actually to find evidence of human evolution. Now, it was common thought at the time that uh, among the nobility of Europe that humans first evolved in Europe because they were all Eurocentrists and thought, oh, only the good things happened in Europe, so man must have come from Europe. And Stromer thought that they were dead wrong and thought that they came from Africa. Turns out he was right, but he wouldn't have found that out going where he did. He went to, his destination was the Bahariya Oasis in Egypt, which as opposed to the couple thousand to maybe one or two million years old that he was looking for, he was walking into sediments that were 90 million years old. A little bit off on that estimate there. So during the expedition there and even coming back, he discovered dozens of fantastic creatures uh, long-necked uh, long -necked herbivores that would make the ground shake when they moved, gigantic, horrifying carnivores, but, uh, sharks, turtles, crocodiles, everything. But the crown jewel of this expedition would be found in 1912 when he was on his way back. And it was an absolutely bizarre creature unlike anything he had ever seen. Now, it had a jaw that was a yard long. It had these cone-like teeth that were very pointed, obviously the teeth of a meat-eating animal. But most characteristically, it had these huge spines coming out of its vertebrae. These things got upwards of six to seven feet long, and they were unlike anything Stromer had ever seen before, unlike anything known to paleontology at the time. So he reconstructed the animal looking like, animal, uh, looking like other carnivorous dinosaurs that they knew of, looking kind of like that, and only the gray ones are the ones that he had actually found. And he named the creature Spinosaurus aegypticus, meaning the Egyptian spined lizard. Now, he took these fossils back to the Berlin Museum, uh, well, in Berlin, geez, Scott, um, uh, where they would sit and be studied for quite a while until one fateful day in, on April 12th, uh, 12th, 24th, 1944. Now, as most of you might know, World War II was raging across Europe at this time. It was coming near its end, but the Allies, particularly Britain, had been incessant on bombing Berlin this, uh, essentially as long as after the Battle of Britain. So Stromer was pleading with, his, uh, with the museum's uh, director to, to let him move his specimens out of the museum in case it got bombed, because these are priceless artifacts. 
and unfortunately, the head of the museum was a Nazi, and Stromer was not. Uh, he was actually very famous for being critical of the Nazi uh, organization, and so, guess whose fossils didn't get moved out of the museum? And on that night, the museum was bombed, the, uh, all of his specimens were destroyed, leaving behind only his sketches and some sepia-toned pictures. Now, uh, now, Stromer discovered over 45 different species of fossil animals, which should have made him a legend in the field at the time, but unfortunately, he would never really see the fame that he all rightly deserved. And instead, he would actually become famous, not for what he had found, but for what he had lost. So even though we, know, we knew so comparatively little back then about Spinosaurus, artists could not resist the temptation to reconstruct such a fascinating looking animal. And, but because we had so little of it, the sketches were a little, not what we, not what we would expect, but, these animals were, uh, these illustrations were based on what the people knew at the time. So a lot of them kind of look like generic carnivorous dinosaurs with a big sail on its back, uh, which is kind of all they knew. Uh, and what I think is kind of funny is a lot of them actually depict Spinosaurus as walking on all fours, which is particularly weird because no other carnivorous dinosaur that we knew of uh, walks on all fours. I mean, that's odd, they all have really long back legs, which I think would have been uh, influenced by Dimetrodon, uh, which lived, again, before the time of the dinosaurs. Dimetrodon was not a dinosaur. Excuse me. Um, it's actually much closer related to us than it is to any dinosaur. But this four-legged, bizarre animal probably helped influence the early depictions of Spinosaurus. And these depictions would be the norm until a, discover until a freak discovery in Surrey, England in 1983, where they found a, another absolutely weird dinosaur that looked like nothing else. It had these long crocodile-like jaws and a huge hand claw. And that's actually being held by its discoverer, William Walker, there. And so, this animal was named after its discoverer and after that iconic claw, and they gave it the name Baryonyx walkeri, so Walker's heavy claw. And what was really curious about this animal, besides those bizarre anatomical adaptations, was what, was they, what they found in its stomach. The animal was actually so well preserved that they could find some traces of stomach contents. Now, in its belly, they found bones of uh, a baby iguanodon, which makes sense for a carnivorous dinosaur, but what they found even more of was fish scales, tons and tons of fish scales. And from finding other dinosaurs that looked similar to Baryonyx, they were able to figure out that these dinosaurs were fish eaters. They waded through waters catching fish with their long crocodile jaws and their large claws. And paleontologists were immediately struck by the similarities to the enigmatic Spinosaurus. So they named this group of dinosaurs the Spinosaurids after that original find. So this, w and the, the discovery of the Spinosaurids would influence even more our depictions of Spinosaurus. Now, instead of looking like the generic carnivore that we thought it did originally, it now much more resembles a, basically a big baryonyx or a Suchomimus. That was another one of the Spinosaurids that was found. It literally means crocodile mimic. Uh, it, had the, it has those long jaws, those longer arms. It's not walking on all fours anymore, uh, but it still keeps that big iconic sail. And this is rather famously where we get the depiction that we see in Jurassic Park 3, where it rather infamously kills the T-Rex within the first five minutes that they're on the island, earning the ire of every Jurassic fan from then on. Uh, and this would be the generally accepted look of what Spinosaurus was for quite a while again until a chance discovery, uh, until 
Mor uh, until 2008, where in Morocco, we have to introduce you guys to another paleontologist uh, by the name of Nizar Ibrahim. Uh, he was from the University College Dublin and was working on his PhD uh, that was actually inspired by Stromer's work. Uh, he was working in the Kem Kem beds in Morocco and was, and was really impassioned by all that Stromer had done for the field of paleontology and the area that he worked in. So he was trying to work in a similar area and kind of follow in his footsteps. Now, during one of his expeditions, uh, a Bedouin uh, fossil hunter came up to him and presented him with this rather bizarre purple sediment that was streaked with yellow and sticking out of these sediments was this milky white bone that was kind of at a blade-shaped cross-section. Now, it was fascinating, but unfortunately, because the tribesmen just kind of came up to him and was like, here you go, I found this. It was devoid of all geological context and was therefore essentially useless to science. But he procured them anyways so he could give them to the collections at Casablanca. But years is, but they always stuck with him. And years later, when he was visiting some colleagues at the Natural History Museum in Milan, Italy, uh, they were like, oh, hey, uh, Ibrahim, come here, check this out. We found these going to North Egypt, or, well, uh, North Africa, a while ago. And, he f and what he, they showed him were these yellow streaked purple sediments with a white cross section of bone sticking out. And he was immediately reminded of that previous find. In fact, he thought, oh my gosh, these might actually even be from the same animal. So with that in mind, a couple years later when he had time to do it, he boarded a plane to Morocco to go find the tribesmen who gave him the bones. Now, unfortunately, all he knew about the guy was he was wearing white, and he had a mustache. It's <laughs> about it. And given that part of the world, that's essentially nothing to go on besides, well, he had a face, but... Uh, so he went there just for a weekend because he thought that if I don't find the guy immediately, then I'm probably never going to find him, or at least I'm going to set the... Uh, or at least I'm going to plant the seeds that will lead to me finding him. So on the last day of his trip to Morocco, he was sitting in a cafe with some of his colleagues, and who walks by but the tribesmen. And so on March 3rd, 2013, he runs up to the guy, grabs him by the shoulders, goes like, oh my gosh, I've been looking for you, and the guy immediately recognizes him. They chat a little bit, and he takes him to go find uh, to the place where he found those fossils. And what they found baffled everyone, not least of which Ibrahim. They found the most complete skeleton of Spinosaurus that had been yet discovered. And wow, was it weirder than anybody thought possible. In fact, it looked like this. Pretty strange, right? <laughs> kind of looks like nothing else that we know of, and it still kind of doesn't. I mean, it has... The, the sail on its back is less of a D shape and more of a soft M. It has these tiny little back legs and these even longer front legs and an even longer tail. And its bone density indicates that it would have spent much, if not all, of its time in the water hunting fish. There were some giant fish living at that time, but this would have kept it from coming into competition with the other massive carnivores they were living in that area at the time, some of which Stromer even discovered. And what's even funnier about this, and I love this, is the new revelations on Spinosaurus' anatomy actually rekindled a, uh, an old theme that we saw back in the first depictions of Spinosaurus, of <coughs> did it actually walk on its back legs? Because, I mean, look at those things. They're so small. So there's some paleontologists that actually think that Spinosaurus might have walked on all fours like they originally thought. Now, its hands could not turn the way ours do and put them flat on the ground like that, and they had those giant claws, so it might have walked on its knuckles like an anteater. But yeah, bizarre animal. I absolutely love this thing. So 
while that is the story of Spinosaurus, it's, not, it's absolutely not the story of every dinosaur, but we need to keep it in mind of this is how much that our understanding of this is how much we are lacking in our understanding of these animals. I mean, if you look back at what we thought it was before and this, it's ridiculous, it's night and day. But with other dinosaurs, we've seen a whole lot of changes too. Namely, the, the feather revolution of giving all of these dinosaurs feathers that you guys might have seen in news articles or in documentaries and stuff. And I bet a lot of you guys have kind of questions about that. So to answer them, we're gonna go back to that family tree that I showed earlier. And we're gonna figure out which dinosaurs had feathers. And we're going to look for dinosaurs that specifically have direct evidence of having feathers. And when I say direct evidence, I mean direct fossil evidence. Oh, crap, I touched something. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, starting that again. All right, ready to scroll to the, yeah, crap. Oh, great, it doesn't want to go. Oh, it's there. OK, fixed it. Don't touch that. OK, so direct evidence of feathers in the fossils. And when I mean that, I mean things like this. This is the cast of the, one of the first birds, Archaeopteryx. Now you can see, if I don't have it directly in the light, uh, the skeleton here and all of these feather imprints coming out in the sediment around it from its arms and its legs and its tail. So this is one way that we know that certain dinosaurs had feathers. We can also see direct evidence on its skeleton, uh, whether that's uh, quill knobs on the bones where we see that feathers would have attached or th things that were similar. So I think we all can agree. So we're gonna look at which dinosaurs had, we have evidence of feathers. So I think we all can agree that birds have feathers. We all good on that? Everybody on, on that page? All right, good. I'm glad I haven't lost you yet. So, we also know that the raptors had feathers, the dromaeosaurs. We have direct evidence on their skeletons. We have feather imprints. We have a huge mountain of evidence that essentially all of the, well, all the ones that we know, pretty much all the ones that we know of had feathers. So, if this group of dinosaurs had feathers, and if that group of dinosaurs had feathers, it makes sense that the common ancestor between them, what they both came from, would have had feathers. So fill it in like that. And that is what is called uh, a phylogenetic bracketing. Now you guys can throw out that term at parties and make whole lots of friends. I've, <laughs> trust me, I've done it all zero times. It's great. but. Uh, and then, if we, find, if we look at other dinosaurs, it was, re it was relatively recently found that there were some tyrannosaurs that had feathers. This is Eutyrannus, the largest feathered dinosaur that we have found so far. So if tyrannosaurs had feathers, then it makes sense that the common ancestor between these guys and tyrannosaurs had feathers. So we fill that in. But then things get a little bit tricky with some rather bizarre dinosaurs. We have uh, Cetacosaurus, which was a ceratopsian. It had these big quill-like structures going down its back, which we're not 100% sure if those are feathers. It might sound like something funny to say out loud, but we really don't. They could be something unique to that branch of dinosaurs, but they could be. They look a whole lot like feathers. And then we have Culindodromius from uh, Siberia, it's one of the ornithopods. It was covered in this fuzzy coating, but again, we're not sure if it's feathers. And we have the heterodontosaurus. Again, not sure if those are feathers that it's covered with. But if all of these turn out to be feathers, then does that mean that the common ancestor between those and the other ones had feathers? Which would mean all dinosaurs had feathers. But we don't know that, per se. This is an area of paleontology that is really up for debate and really uh, we're lacking a whole lot of evidence in it because feathers don't like to fossilize. They're really delicate things. But then we also have other animals like the pterosaurs are covered in this fur feather-like pycnofibers as we call them. We don't know exactly what they are. They could be feathers. If they are, does that mean that that common ancestor had feathers? And if so, how far does it go back? Are our crocodiles the weird ones of not having feathers? Did they lose them when they went in the water? We don't know. These are things that this is probably, well, definitely going to change in the years to come. If there's anything I need to update, it's gonna be this slide. Uh, so 
bet you guys might be asking yourself, why even have feathers for certain dinosaurs? Now, the answer is, is the, the thing to keep in mind is that evolution does not plan ahead. The reason that the answer to why did dinosaurs have feathers is not so they could fly when they became birds. They would have had to have a use for feathers besides that. They would have helped them in their daily lives. So what do you guys think are some of the reasons for something to have feathers? Just shout them out. Warmth, uh, cooling, uh, courtship, display. Um, how about mobility, moving around? Yes? Shedding water. Shedding water, that could be a thing too. So, but we're gonna focus on temperature control, thermoregulation, mobility, and display. So even though it's common to think of the time of the dinosaurs as being this hot, muggy, tropical place all over the world, there were actually a lot of times that had glaciers and it snowed and actually had, there was uh, many times where it had climates that were even similar to Michigan today. I really pity those guys. But feathers on, uh, feathers on dinosaurs that were living in these colder climates would have been very useful. Uh, to keep them warm. But not only for dinosaurs that were in colder environments, also for really small dinosaurs. Because when animals are really small, it, it takes a whole lot more energy to keep them warm. Uh, that's something called the square cube law, that if you take a, uh, an object and make it bigger, then the volume, the, in, the inside of that object, increases at a bigger rate than the outside. If you were to take, and that's a really big problem for warm-blooded animals, like we're pretty sure dinosaurs were. If we were to take an elephant and make it the size of a mouse, it would freeze and die. If we, make, if we took a mouse and made it the size of an elephant, it would cook itself and die, because it just doesn't have enough surface area to get rid of that heat. So tiny dinosaurs and baby dinosaurs would have been very benefited from having a thick coat of feathers, kind of like down that we see on chicks, like these little adorable tyrannosaur chicks we see there. <laughs> but then we get into the debate of what about when they got bigger? So let's, let's take tyrannosaurus for an example. Uh, we kind of don't know the extent of how feathered it would have been. It was in the family of dinosaurs that were 99% sure had feathers, but was it feathered, crap, <laughs> was it feathered like a grizzly bear has fur, or was it feathered like an elephant has hair? Like rather minimal and only on key places. Now judging from the size of the thing, it's probably more in this area, but this is still plausible. And if anybody says that feathered dinosaurs don't look scary and don't look cool, I want you to show them this picture and prove them wrong. <laughs> so di uh, feathers also would have helped out a whole bunch with moving around. So if we look at the two basic body plans of dinosaurs, the two-legged and the four-legged dinosaurs, and we show where their centers of gravity are, which are those yellow balls there, uh, we, can see, uh, we can see that the two-legged dinosaurs were built kind of like a seesaw. That uh, While their weight is pretty well distributed, its only uh, point of contact with the ground is right in the middle. And four-legged dinosaurs are built more like a table. They're pretty sturdy things. So yeah, with the two-legged dinosaurs, all their weight is either really far out in front or really far behind that center of gravity. With four-legged dinosaurs, right in the middle, pretty stable, they're pretty good. But this is a problem when two-legged dinosaurs want to move around because all that weight away from that pivot point creates what's called in engineering a uh, moment of inertia. So if we use something like my rock hammer here, and where we have all of the weight really far away from the place where it moves, and we swing it around. I mean, you guys have swung a hammer before. You know it takes a little bit of effort, and it wants to, it wants to keep going when you stop it. Uh, so that would have been a problem with two-legged dinosaurs. But if you have all the weight near the middle where you're pivoting it, you can move it around pretty easily. So that would have made two-legged dinosaurs have essentially a really bad turning radius. And feathers would have helped out a whole bunch with that when they're moving around. They would have possibly acted a whole lot like control surfaces on an airplane, of all things. We can actually see this with modern dinosaurs, with the ostrich. You can see while it's running, an ostrich will pop out a wing on the inside of its turn to cause drag on that side of its body so it can turn a whole lot quicker. Now, four-legged animals don't have that problem as much, but it 
definitely was a problem with two-legged dinosaurs. And it also would have helped them stay on the back of struggling prey while they were taking something down and keep their balance. And it also would have unlocked a really cool movement ability that was ex that's essentially exclusive to dinosaurs, and that's called wing-assisted incline running. That's where birds, that we can see this in modern birds, even ones that cannot fly yet, they can flap their wings in just the right way to cause enough forward pressure to stick them to a surface so they can run up vertical surfaces. So, while raptors might not have been the best at climbing trees, they could run up them, which is horrifying. <laughs> But it would have essentially acted like the rope that a climber uses when they're rappelling up the side of a building. And this would have allowed them, allowed predators to get up into the trees to look for prey down below them, or for uh, ones to escape becoming prey themselves by getting somewhere that the predator couldn't follow. Now, I heard a lot of people talking about display, because, I mean, dinosaurs are notorious show-offs. There's so many of them that have so many uh, vibrant display structures. We have the sails on the backs of a lot of dinosaurs like Spinosaurus, Aronosaurus, and the weird shark-like concavenator. We have the, the skull structures like the famous two crests on Dilophosaurus, and that's the one that spits poison in the first Jurassic Park, and that is a complete lie. They did not do that. Uh, we have like the Elvis-style pompadour of uh, Cryolophosaurus, or the crest of Guanlong, or the horns of Ceratosaurus. We have the really bizarre dinosaurs, like the spikes going down the neck of a Margosaurus, or the plates on the back of a Stegosaur. And then we have the undisputed kings of these giant flamboyant display structures, the Ceratopsians and the Hadrosaurs, with those massive frills and those big head crests, which these things took on so many shapes and sizes that I don't even have the slightest amount of time to get into all of those. They were um, incredible animals. But feathers, no doubt, would have helped with this. Whether we're scaring off rivals or scaring off predators or attracting mates or anything, really, feathers would have really helped in those areas. I mean, we see modern birds doing this all the time. So, like modern birds, those structures probably would have been very brightly colored. But how do we know that about dinosaurs? What's really cool is we actually definitively know the colors of some dinosaurs. So, these ones right here, essentially, as far as we know, that's what they looked like. We're able to look at the melanin cells in their uh, feathers and skin and stuff and figure out what those colors were, what they were being coded for in colors and see those. We have Sinoceropteryx that has this red brown coat with the white bands on its tail like a red panda, or the gray brown body and brilliant red mohawk of Anchiornis. Or that we have a single feather from Archaeopteryx that we know is black. I mean, that's all we know about it. We, we know it at least had one black feather. We don't know where it was, but <laughs> one feather was black. Great. Uh, and then we have the four-winged dinosaur Microraptor that was completely black. And in fact, there's evidence that it was uh, iridescent, like a raven. So, and we also have the best-known colored dinosaur, which is Cetacosaurus, which, I mean, I don't think you guys will be surprised when I tell you means the parrot lizard because of that big parrot-like beak there. And again, we don't know if those things, those quills on its tail are feathers or not, but we know they were there. And this is exactly what this animal looked like, as far as we can tell. It would have had a lighter belly, a darker top, and had a gradient going there, which would have helped it blend in in an environment with diffuse lighting, like a forest or something like that, which shows that other dinosaurs would have been able to see it like we see it, which means they probably had color vision. In fact, modern birds have vision that's better than us. Some of them can even see into the ultraviolet, so we have no idea how incredibly colored a lot of these dinosaurs could have been. So that pretty much wraps it up. Uh, I hope that when you guys think of dinosaurs, you don't think of these movie monsters of a bygone era covered in green and brown and drab tones. Instead, you think of them less like these dragons of the screen and more like living, breathing animals that were just as vibrant as anything living today. Thank you guys very much.
All righty. So, I guess we have time for some questions. Yes. Of course. They're all important. What killed off the dinosaurs? Okay, so in terms of mass extinctions, with all of the mass extinctions that we know of, there have been, there have been five that we know of, and people argue that we're going into a six. All of them show that the die-off of, the, of those animals was relatively gradual, except for the end Cretaceous mass extinction, the KPG. That, we know, was really sudden. Like, the geological equivalent of overnight, 70% of all things that were living were just gone. So we know that a meteor hit the Yucatan Peninsula right at that time. And there was also these massive vulcanization events happening over in India, a place that we call the Deccan Traps. But the thing is, because they're on the opposite sides of the world, and because of the way that sediment and geology works, we actually don't know what came first, or if they happened at the same time, but it's pretty clear that one of those, if not both, had something to do with the dinosaurs dying out. It was either the it could have been any order. They could have happened at the same time. So those were probably what killed off the dinosaurs. And one other question. Yes. What do you think that sonar is going to find uh, looking for that Loch Ness monster? Uh, it's going to find a lot of sticks and fish. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yes. Any others? It's a claw. This is actually the clawed velociraptor, that big and large second toe that if you've seen Jurassic Park that it has that clicks on the ground sometimes. But yeah, velociraptor was a whole lot smaller than you see it in Jurassic Park. In fact, this is a life-size skull of velociraptor. It was only about the size of a turkey. It was like two feet tall, six feet long. Probably would have filled a similar evolutionary niche or like uh, environmental niche, so like the organism's job of either like a roadrunner or a coyote or something like that. I did not mean to make a Looney Tunes reference, but I totally <laughs> did. Uh, meet me. Uh, yeah. Scott, yes. can you tell us about your find of the mastodon and, and the, the, the mammoth, yeah. Mammoth. Sorry. Now, I can't take any credit for that. Uh, that was, it was in Chelsea, Michigan. It was found by the landowner, uh, Jim Brisley, really cool dude. But uh, I was actually, I wasn't even on there, the, the, I wasn't even part of the dig on the first day, but on the, I was getting ready for class one morning. I'd just gotten out of the shower and poured myself a bowl of cereal, and I decided I wanted to look a little nice that day. So I put on some nicer clothes, sitting down for my breakfast, and I get a call from my boss, uh, who never calls me. And so I pick up the phone, I'm like, hey, Bill, what's going on? He's like, Scott, if you get your butt here in 10 minutes, you could go dig up a mammoth. I'm like, uh, I'm like 20 minutes from the museum. I said 10 minutes. And so I'm, I look down at my nicer clothes, I'm like, screw it, okay. And I run the entire way to the museum, get there completely out of breath, jump in our collections manager's car, and go on, dig up a mammoth. And it was a blast. And I also got to be part of the team that went back in uh, November 2017 to go see if we missed anything because the original dig was only one day because uh, Jim Bristley was in the middle of harvesting his field and he's like, I kind of don't want you guys tearing up like half of my fields looking for a mammoth. I have a job, I have a life to, to live. But um, he actually, when we found this out when we went back, he renamed his farm in honor of that discovery, and it is now called Mammoth Acres. It's a fantastic little place. He even, he even had like a work jacket with a little logo on it. He was super, he was super proud of it. It was really cool. It's in Chelsea, Michigan. Yeah. No, it's not. Well, oh, oh, where's the mammoth? Yeah, the, the mammoth at the University of Michigan. So, unfortunately, our museum is closed at the moment because we're moving museums. We're getting an entirely new building, moving our collection space into a new, actually modern collection space instead of being in a, I'm not joking, converted crawl space with no airflow, no con air conditioning, and no humidity control. Lovely. Uh, into a much more modern space. But the Bristly Mammoth is going to be on display in our new building, which is opening in 2019. Oh, it's very big. Uh, it's mammoth, yes. Uh, it, it's, it, was, it was a big old, 
it, it was a big old bull mammoth, so it, it was absolutely gigantic. It was like, oh God, I want to say like 12 or 13 feet tall at the shoulder or something like that. It was huge. It was one of the biggest mammoths that we have discovered. So, yeah. Yes. We didn't find, we found a, a little bit more, which was actually really curious. We, we were, because we didn't find any elements of the limb skeleton, no, no real uh, front legs or back legs, which we were kind of looking for when we went back. Even though we did find these big boulders in the first time that we think were evidence of human butchery uh, back when uh, this thing was originally being buried. So we were looking for the limb bones, but we almost kind of didn't want to find them because if we didn't, then that means like, oh man, something or someone must have taken them away. And we didn't find them, but we did find a couple more vertebrae and a, like two ribs or something like that. So we didn't find much when we went back, but we did find some stuff. Um, yes? What's the site in Auburn Hills? Auburn Hills, I'm not familiar with that one. Mammoth site there? Oh. Uh, Mammoth or Mastodon site. I bet we have the material from that, but I can't think of what site it would have been off the top of my head. Okay. Um, anybody else? Yes. Oh, Sue the T-Rex. Yeah. Um, she's at the Field Museum. Uh, well, currently she's off display because they're remounting her because her old mount was a little outdated at this point. Uh, she was actually missing some of the elements of her skeleton. They didn't give her the belly ribs that she would have had in real life. She was found in South Dakota, I wanna say. Sue the T-Rex follows me on Twitter, so I should get that right, or else she's gonna get mad at me. Um, <laughs> I love that I can say that too. But yeah, she's the biggest and most complete Tyrannosaurus that is known. Uh, yes? They are. So they replaced Sue with a titanosaur, which, as its name suggests, is huge. Uh, so if any of you guys have been to the field and have seen Sue, one of the things that I've heard a little bit from some of my friends who have gone is because they put Sue in the big like ent uh, entryway atrium, she kind of looked a little small, even though she was like... 15, 20 feet tall and like 40, 50 feet long. Like she kind of looked a little small in the space. So they're putting a titanosaur, one of the big long neck dinosaurs on display there, which was probably upwards of like nine, 10 times the size of Sue. So uh, they're, calling, they're calling him Maximo and he would have in life weighed about the same as an entire herd of like 12, 14 African elephants. It was an enormous animal. It's like somewhere like 80, 90 feet long, something like that, huge. It's, okay, it's, it's one of the largest. Everybody always likes to claim that, oh, we have the largest, we have, it's the largest mounted one. It's not, at least as far as I know. I don't think it is the largest, it, I'm pretty sure it's not the largest titanosaur that we know, but that gets into a whole, is it the largest one that we found or is it the largest one that we can measure the size of? Because um, it gets weird. <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions? Dinosaur on your belt buckle. Dinosaur on my belt buckle, oh yes. Yeah, that's uh, Ceratosaurus. Uh, it's from Jurassic North America and Portugal, I believe. It had, it was, it, it's named for those horns that were above its eyes and the big blade-like one on its nose. It means the, the horned lizard. It would have lived alongside Allosaurus and stuff like that, but it was a slightly more, it was slightly more basal, I guess, a primitive uh, carnivorous dinosaur than a lot of the other ones that were living at the time. I don't have a gift. I wish I had a gift shop. I, I just I just look at the weird I just look at the weird parts of uh, eBay and Etsy and stuff like that because uh, there are other dinosaur lovers out there like me that do make cool dinosaur stuff. I mean, I got this Archaeopteryx lapel pin from a person I follow on Twitter, so that's a, another really fun one. Um, yes. I loved Barney when I was a kid. I loved Barney when I was a kid. Uh, yes. Do I have a book out? 
Uh, no, I don't. Um, uh, unfortunately, I, I, the only thing I've published is, I, I, well, I, I haven't actually published anything, but uh, I've, I've done a, uh, I made a poster for the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology conference a couple years ago. So, I mean, I'm on my way. I'm just starting out. I might have worked, I might have worked in this field since I was 14, but I wasn't publishing papers since I was 14. Uh, I would love to do one at some point, uh, but yeah. Um, uh, yes? It's a chore. Every day is a burden. I, uh, I can barely get out of bed most days. It's, uh, no, of course not. What? I, have I been? I think I've been. Oh, yes, yes, uh, the Dinosaur National Monument. That was actually on, oh man, can I, I'll, I'll pull up the That's picture. It was, in the, it was in the first, it was in my about me section. So this is, that's Vern, Utah. That's the Dinosaur National Monument with tiny I little Scott sti it. Yeah, I, I know. I, I I've, grew up there. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I love that place. Oh man, it's fantastic. Other questions? No, I don't. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, just, I just recently graduated. I just finished my undergrad. So, uh, yeah, I saw one over here. Yes? I was just going to ask, did you do anything um, like working with kids and teaching them about dinosaurs? I actually don't currently. I've mostly been working back in our prep lab, which is where we uh, do all the processes from when we take a fossil in from the field to where we remove it from the rock that's surrounding it, make molds, casts, all that good stuff, sometimes paint them for display in museums. Uh, that's mostly what I have have my background in. I mean, I would love to teach people. I think I'm not awful at it. <laughs> so, yeah, I would, I would love to at some point in the future. Yes? What are my plans for the future? Do we have like a, a big like chaise lounge we should lay down in and just um, but uh, get, a job. get a job? Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Captain Bob, everybody. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, my plans for the future. I'm. I mean, I am applying to jobs all over the U.S. and well, all over essentially anywhere at the moment. <laughs> Uh, I would love to work in prep or in education and outreach because I love sharing my passion of these animals with other like-minded people. Um, but right now, it's kind of just get my foot in the door and go somewhere and find something. But I would love to do something more education and outreach oriented in the future. Uh, yes, I'm back there. What's your favorite dinosaur and why? My favorite dinosaur. It's a great question. So my favorite dinosaur is a Utah raptor, which... Uh, was the owner of this giant claw. So it was in the same family, <coughs> excuse me, that includes Velociraptor and Deinonychus and things like that. But to give you guys a size comparison, that is the, the killer claw, as, we, as some people call it, in, uh, uh, on Velociraptor, that enlarged second claw. And this is the one on Utah Raptor. It's a bit of a bigger animal. This one was actually much more in line with the size of the velociraptors you see in Jurassic Park. It was about six, seven feet tall and about 20 feet long. It was a, on similar size, well, not length, obviously, but a similar size to like a grizzly bear. So yeah, uh, that's my favorite dinosaur. And I like it because, well, I mean, at first it was just because it was the biggest raptor and I liked raptors. But in recent years, we've actually, there have been more discoveries of Utah Raptor, and it has been found that it was almost like Spinosaurus, way weirder than we had any thought of before. It was much more stocky and really heavily built, and it had a slightly downturned front jaw, and we kind of don't know why it had those things. But it was kind of, it was much more like, with some of the other raptor dinosaurs, they were much more like, well, the raptors that we think of, with like birds of prey and stuff like that. They were light slender, uh, lightly built animals, and uh, Utah raptor was a whole lot more, it was a brawler. It was like the pit bull of the raptors. So that's my favorite dinosaur. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, they call them velociraptors in Jurassic Park, uh, well, because Utah Raptor wasn't found yet. Um, but uh, Utah Raptor was only found, like, I think it was like a month or two after uh, Jurassic Park came out. It was discovered by Jim Kirkland uh, with the Utah Raptor Project, which that's a really cool thing. Look that up. Uh, but uh, they were actually based on Deinonychus, which is another raptor dinosaur, which its name very appropriately means terrible claw. And we mean, we mean terrible, like fearfully great or awe-inspiring, not terrible like it sucks. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and so, they, so it was actually much more based on Deinonychus, which was like wolf size, not coyote size. So uh, that's the velociraptors in Jurassic Park. Uh, yes? Oh, at the Detroit Zoo? Yeah. Uh, I went there a couple of years ago, and I'm pretty sure they're the same ones. Uh, there's a lot of them that are pretty accurate. Uh, if, not, if memory serves, like some of their oviraptors and stuff have feathers. Uh, some of their, uh, a lot of their <laughs> dromaeosaurs have feathers. Those are pretty good. Some of the big, dino uh, some of the big carnivorous dinosaurs they have uh, were not the best. Uh, they're not awful. Uh, there, there was actually. Uh, when I went a couple of years ago with some of my friends, we actually we, we played a game where uh, they ran ahead of me and covered up the nameplate and were just, Scott, tell me what it is. So uh, I was guessing a bunch of them and uh, not to sound like I'm making excuses for myself, but the only ones I didn't get were ones that we don't know enough to really know what it looks like. So yeah, so I'm grading on a curve, I guess. <laughs> yes. Oh man, uh, picking a like area of dinosaurs that I would like to study. God, that's like picking a favorite child. I don't know. Um, I mean, I like it, it's it's hard to really say. I, I like dinosaurs in general, so it's hard for me to really narrow it down. I mean, I love the dromaeosaurs, I love the raptors, but like every time I learn more about a group, they become some of my favorites. I like, there's some really bizarre ones. I don't think I included many pictures of the Therizinosaurs, that they are just some of the most absolutely bizarre dinosaurs that you've ever thought of. There are these big, like, take a, oh, let's see, like, take a turkey, make it pot-bellied, and make it bigger than a T-Rex, and, or like the size of a T-Rex, and give it, like, four foot long claws on each of its hands. I mean, Therizinosaurus, its name literally means the scythe lizard. Uh, so they were horrifying and they had big long necks, but they had tiny little heads and they ate plants and we don't know why they had these huge horrifying claws on their arms. They're so weird. So that's a group that I love. I love the hadrosaurs, the, I mean, all of them. So I don't want to choose, basically. When are you going to go on your next dig? About nine days. Something like that? It's coming up on that. I'm, uh, no, it's a little bit more than that. I'm leaving on the 9th, so more than that. I'm going to the, the yep, Price, Utah, the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry. And it's hot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm expecting it to be as hot, if not hotter, than the time I went to the Hell Creek, which uh, I was drinking like seven liters of water a day, uh, which that was, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Anything else? Try on my Indiana Jones hat? Oh, of course. Of course. Absolutely. So, I mean, we have to, so. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for being an absolutely incredible audience. I could not have asked for a better one. So, if, if you guys have any other questions, you can come up to me afterwards, ask me. Ask me anything, basically. So thank you guys so much, and thank you to the Troy Historic Village.